Right, I'm here with Rebecca Shawcross today um, at the uh, Museum um, of Shoes in Northampton um, and we're just going to um, have a look at the archive uh, with regards to uh, Debbie Pumps. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to actually find out what is the history, where does it come from, this whole idea of a flat shoe. And um, Rebecca's going to sort of lead me through some of the more um, exclusive, you don't always have them on show, do you? No, no. So these are, I mean, our permanent galleries, we have about a thousand on display at any one time. Okay. And then we have another... 11,000 in store. Ah, 11,000. <laughs> That's a lot of shoes. Yeah, so some of those will get exhibited or displayed in temporary exhibitions sometimes, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and sometimes they get loaned out to the museums, and then sometimes they may not be fit for display, but they are still incredibly useful for people to see yeah. you know, examples Absolutely. or how they're constructed. So. Absolutely. So we started um, by looking at um, a, a, a Saxon shoe. Oh, we looked at yeah, the medieval Poulain, which had the pointed toe, which which I think you'll we'll get out. Yeah, you know, yeah. we'll get out. Later. But yes, I mean basically the medieval shoes for both men and women, and the Tudor, which then um, is a very similar shoe but just with a very wide toe, mm -hmm. whereas the medieval Poulain has a very pointed toe. They, they're completely flat, so they have no okay. heel. And that was really pretty much throughout shoe history until then. Yeah. So until 1590s, shoes were completely flat soled. Right. Apart from the little blip of the sort of Venetian Chopin, but that really is considered a platform sole shoe as right. opposed to one with a heel. Right. Um, so that's like a blip, but it doesn't, it doesn't really have a heel as right. such because it's just which well, isn't a platform really. Right. So yeah, so they're all flat sold until then, very simple shoes. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the 1590s, and I think it's 15, 1598, there is the first reference to shoes with a heel. Mm -hmm. And it's actually um, in Queen Elizabeth's warrant list. There is like a, they obviously, she obviously lists all her clothes and wow. what she has in her wardrobe, which includes um, a pair of shoes, and I think the um, description is something like a pair made from Spanish leather with a with a sort of low heel. Wow. Um, and that's like the first reference, reference that we actually to get it. to heels being on shoes. Okay. Nobody really knows why. You know, just whether started to go up. Yes. And Maybe sort of it's a vanity thing. Maybe taller people were yes. considered. Sort of better jeans or better or sort of status? Better status, because it suddenly became, as soon as heels were added onto shoes, both men's and women's shoes, mm -hmm. uh, then it was a sign of status, mm -hmm. you know, the higher the heel. And um, like King Louis the Fourteenth, he had very high heels because he was obviously very mm. short. <laughs> but he also took the opportunity. He had like little scenes painted on the heels. Oh, you then get red heels, which are very significant uh -huh. because red was a sign that you were somebody important and of status. Oh, wow. And this is the thing with shoes in the past, particularly, and I suppose it's the same today, is that. They were a way of telling people where you were in the sort of social the order. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So if you had red heels, initially that meant you were a sign of you know you were wealthy, you were important. You didn't have to tell people you were; they could just see. See from automatically. The shoes. Yes, and it's the same with the medieval wow. poulain. The longer the toe, the more important, the more mm -hmm. wealthy. It was very difficult to walk around. I mean, they are ridiculous shoes. So people used to curl the toes, toes up, up and everything. Yes. yes. And put the bells on. But it was a sign of status that, you know, that you didn't probably have to work, you know, you could go around you right. know, with these very long toes. So yeah, so red red heeled shoes were a sign of status, particularly for men. Mm -hmm. And then gradually they became um, you saw the more women's shoes, right. red heels. And they were still a sign of status, but then gradually they became a bit more of a fashion item. Right, okay. Uh, it sort of got a bit diluted uh -huh. over time. Okay, that's but interesting. Yes, and so 
it's particularly for women's fashion, you then, well, for both men and women, no heel. Uh -huh. Then suddenly, quite high heels for both men and women, mm -hmm. which are either carved wooden heels, covered with the material or the leather of, the, the, of what was used in the shoe, uh -huh. or a stacked heel, which is just layers of leather, um, mm -hmm. and then nailed together. So you've got those two types. And then as you get towards the end of the um, 18th century, for women, heels then start to go lower. Yeah. So, I mean, you have, so at the beginning, you would have something like this. Mm -hmm. So you've got your high heel, which is, this is wood, covered in the, the material, with the leather sole, pointed toe, and latchet tie shoes, so you can see the little yeah. ribbon. Yeah. So that's like a, quite a consistent style. And there's a big change. So <laughs> they do, in essence, look the Very same, similar. really, with the heel and the, and the upturned toe, is that you would then just get the buckle latchets, which would go across the instep, and then you would pin your mm -hmm. buckle through. And buckles were seen as um, pieces of jewellery. So you got a new pair of shoes, you would just transfer your, your buckle. buckle to the, the new pair. Oh, lovely. So these styles for women were around a very long time. And then as you get towards the end of the 18th century, what happens is you get sort of a transitional stage where you, you start to go low, yeah. the heel gets lower. You see the first wedges, I mean this is um, 1718, right. um, and the wedge was really to help support the weight of the wearer, right. because this point of the shoe's really weak. You sometimes find where they've been snapped under the weight oh, of the wearer. Really? Mm. So obviously, to amend that kind of mm, yeah, okay. So it's moving with the body. Because yeah, because what they used to do, shoemakers, to try and strengthen this was to, you can see the the, the leather sole runs all the way and then down the yeah. heel breast. Yeah. Whereas if you see a shoe today, the sole stops there yeah, yeah. and then it's a sort of separate entity. Yeah. So that was a sort of way of keeping, well, giving a little added strength. Yeah. Then they had little wedges, and then you get these very little tiny, tiny heels, sort of started to be known as Italian heels, influenced by the Italians. Okay. Um, and then, where's the... I've got a question mm. for you. Is how we've actually, in the UK, made our shoes, has that been the influence more globally and towards America? Is that is that how they've got their influence or have we like our like our um, histories generally yes. sort of drawn out it's across the world of. because of our empire building? Is that how can everyone sort of trace it back to us basically, that's what I'm saying. Would you say? I think I mean in terms of styles you can it's very much and at this period it's, it's very much France and Paris and London right. so it's sort of almost calling the shots for, for women's footwear okay. and then you do in the 19th century you start to then actually see um, when it's more sort of mass produced and factory based then you, there's a lot of imports from America coming mm -hmm. over and sort of swamping our market as right. well okay. and the French also had a period where they were very good at <laughs> sending their shoes over yeah. um, and sort of swamping the market, particularly in Northampton as well, oh, really? with more like ready-made shoes as opposed to, mm -hmm. because these probably, because they're upper class examples, they will have been bespoke to the, right. to the owner, okay. um, so the shoemaker would have made them specifically for whoever yeah. owned them Right. Okay. in the um, 18th century. There were, there were still though, because um, not everybody could afford obviously to have their no. shoes specifically made for them. No. So you do get at the beginning of the sort of like 1740s, yeah. you get, there are ad, um, adverts which like list the styles that the shoemaker would make okay. and then you get a bespoke price and then you get a, a more sort of ready-made you know, off, you could, off the shelf, off the yeah, <laughs> <laughs> the shelf. <laughs> and then you That's would, interesting. and I think as well, because they're sort of the shoes that they are, you would sort of, they're, they're mouldable, so if yes. they didn't quite fit 
you know, as a bespoke pair of wood, you be able to mould them because they're, they're very soft yeah. leather and as long as you weren't trying to put your very large foot into a, <laughs> a small shoe you know there's that there's a bit of flexibility yeah. particularly with the lovely sort of soft kid leather okay. shoes which has a bit of give yeah. um, and then you know, as you can see here we've still yeah got a little wedge and then this again a very low heel yeah. and it is but you still got the very pointed um, toe and it's a sort of funny transitional period where you get the wedges, the little heels until finally you get, it sort of turns into a... These are my favourite by the way. <laughs> I mean these are a very small example. So you get, we suddenly lose the point, so we get the square toe, it's completely flat um, sole yeah. and very simple. More like a ballet pump. Yeah, and they, they are thought to be the forerunner of the ballet shoe as well. So was it a case of the shoe came before the ballerina wore it, or the ballerina kind of influenced the shoe? I, th we, I think they think, well, they think that um, this style was at a time when people weren't really doing ballet as such. Okay. And so when ballet started, and I have to say I have no idea really when ballet sort of took a hold mm. of when the first ballet was mm. in sort of um, maybe more professional sense but it was thought that they were looking around for a flexible shoe yeah. and then this was a sort of they came upon this style of shoe which is very flexible it's yeah. very soft um, and it you know it will move so it's like perfect and I think it's the end of the 19th century when they ended up with the blocks in them right. so yeah. before that they were just like just and you've got the ribbon ties that go around the ankle because I think yeah. they're quite diff I would imagine that they're quite difficult to keep on yeah. which is why they have the ribbon these ties. little ribbon ties because they're very and those are also straight were those the straight cut still or did we well, have left and right you do get left and right at this point but when you see <laughs> they're so straight <laughs> well, they are so, so straight so you do yes I mean you know you know, if you showed people though, they look exactly the same. Yeah, and a lot of them are made in, in France and they have these little stickers or little labels um, so in the flat. shoe. Yes. <laughs> Just to let you know. I mean, they, yeah, they don't. But they, yes. So you put them on. But they're not going to last. They're only going to survive a few weeks, yes. I would have thought. Do you think those have ever been worn? They don't look like no. they've worn. No, these have never. And I think sizes, I mean, these are a really small size, actually. I mean, they're a bit, they're probably like a, you know, a young person, yeah. you know, rather than a mature, mature lady. Yeah. But um, they are slightly bigger, they start to get bigger, but they, they seem to get narrower at this time as oh, well. Right. So they look really narrow. Because um, there's a sort of, this is a little leather with a quite a thicker oh, heel. Yeah. But there's... You see, that's had a bit of wear. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's a bit, you know, better size, but they still are very simple, you know, slipper shoes. And the leather is like goat leather, so... Again, it's softer. Very soft and very flexible. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not going to, but you could... No, you could fold it. You could bend... <laughs> <laughs> We're yeah, not you, could, <laughs> you could bend them, you know, much more. Mm -hmm. And they are... And then, usually lined. Would you say that the that, that women needed more flexibility in the shoes as they got in that period, in that time period, because they were doing more or? Well it seems to be, again, it's sort of like you go from, you know, wearing this which I think um, would be quite hard to wear and restrict you know what you can do in them but then mm -hmm. there are other class examples so the women you know wouldn't have been probably doing a lot of walking or potentially not mm -hmm. you know it's like when you have those houses with the long walking galleries so if all you're doing is just walking up and you know mm -hmm. taking a slow stroll mm -hmm. indoors mm -hmm. <laughs> you know you could manage that and some much um, French influenced ones have a slightly higher heel and they would have like you know Almost. affected how you the posture right. of you 
And then there, there was, at the end of the 18th century, a more um, view of, yeah, women can walk and they are active and they can go out. And so you do, and you get that transitional stage, but you also get lots of like little boots, which would sort of promote that idea that, wow. I mean, these are a lovely pair, That's that beautiful. you could be more active um, than you were. But then, you know, you then go back. I mean, you can be active in them. I suppose it's difficult to reconcile because lo lots of times people ask me, it's like, well, what, you know, what would you do if you got them wet? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And it's like, well, you'd have to, you know, put up with just wet feet. feet. Or, and then you'd, you'd get home, and then you'd take them out and probably stuff them with something and put them by the fire until they dried out. So mm -hmm. I think people probably put up with a lot more than we yeah. do now. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, sort of, you could still be, act I mean, much more active in these than you could with the yeah, heel. the heels. Definitely. And the little boots, you know, are quite So what's that? That's is that that's fabric and yeah, it's printed. printed with a little star. Wow. And then you've just got yeah, that's a simple ruffle. But yeah, I mean they're really and as the nineteenth century really goes on, then footwear just gets more practical mm. in some ways, mm -hmm. more robust. Mm -hmm. But you do start to get the heel back until you get to the end of um, the 19th century and then there's a very short-lived fashion which if I, I should get one because it's only just here okay. I should come back <laughs> for the wow. so gradually as, I mean the thing you get to the end of the 19th century and so heels start to come back onto women's shoes mm -hmm. and they're quite low mm -hmm. And you might still have a li have a little heel and a square toe, yeah. and there's different combinations. And what they become to most people is looks like what is a court shoe, like mm -hmm. your classic mm -hmm. sort of court shoe style for women now. Yeah. To most people, it's they wouldn't have been known as court shoes. Right. What would they have been known as? Well, they're just almost like slip-on shoes. Okay. And just shoes. They were never just actually just called pumps because in America everything's a pump. Yes. And that's what we're trying to define at Debbie Pumps is that there are sort of there's the court shoe, there's yes. the loafer. Because you get in the nineteenth century you get then you start to get you do get rubber and you start to get rubber soled footwear. Right towards the end of the 19th century, sort of 1870s, 1880s onwards. Mm -hmm. And that will have a canvas upper with the rubber sole. Right. Okay. And um, they were known as um, plimsolls quite early on. Oh. Um, but also, they might have been known as more of a pump, but it had to have the rubber sole. Right. So that was a very active shoe. Yeah. And a lot of the references, which I... I get for you then um, it is you're out and about more and it was a much more of a young person's shoe right. okay. as put in that sort of which I should think what it is is when faced with you know your button boot which would t tightly keep your foot in place yeah. and or a, you know all the other sorts of boots yeah. and the court shoe to wear something that must have been lightweight yes quite simple with a rubber sole which obviously would be quite modern yeah. It must have been quite a liberating I would imagine so. You know, yeah. idea um, really. Are talking about, so 19th century, are we talking about Edwardian period? No, we, we haven't. Yes, yeah, so um, yes. 19th, no, that's 20th. So it's sort of rubber sole footwear is like so 1870s. 1870s. Really? Yeah, the, we've got. We've got um, that's amazing. Just trying to think. I mean, we've got a pair of little child's rubber sole shoes from very early on. Oh it did, it came earlier than you know, you sort of think of really. Wow. And they were sort of known as plimsolls and I think there might have been a reference to pumps. But yes, so they, but a court shoe never referred to as a pump. Right, that's Definitely interesting. Not. <laughs> that's very interesting. So you get the heel and then you get 
at the end of the 19th century, it's sort of like, I mean, I always say short-lived fashion, but it was around for about 10 years, so like from about 1890, 1900, for this style of shoe, with a very high heel. Which is similar to what we're seeing today. I mean, yes. I mean, this would have been really like, you know, it would yeah, be I really would, shocking. I'm, I'm like, <laughs> wow. You know, com you know, if you're in your your court shoe with your little heel. Yes. And then suddenly you see people walking around with this. Yes. Sort of inspired by, they're called Cromwell shoes, inspired oh. by, it's thought, Oliver Cromwell style. Not so much the shoe, but the use of the buckle. Yeah, obviously, yeah. And then you get um, different sorts. You get this tight with the extended sort of tab or tongue. And then you get barrette ones with lots of bars across. Um, and you do get different versions. Well, they're considered quite naughty shoes. Yes, I mean, I think they were considered impractical, and I think eventually they, they became associated with um, women who entertained at home in oh, the bedroom. I see. <laughs> <laughs> so, whereas we well, wouldn't need to actually do no, any walking. Exactly. <laughs> and so, yes. And that's quite a. I mean, they're that's they're really nice. I mean, a just beautiful amazing. shape. Exactly. Just a beautiful shape. And then once you go into the 20th century, then heels are just yeah a couple of inches usually, and then you've got your 1920s ball shoe, um, yeah. which are usually fairly Fine, standard. Yeah. You know, high. They're not high high. No. But that's um, quite for that period. Mm. That is quite amazing. So who was so? What was who was the king at the time of that? Oh boy! No, it would have been still Queen Victoria. Queen Victoria. Yes. Okay. Yes. So she started because we have Queen Victoria's wedding shoes on display. Oh yes. I so saw she them. yeah. So she's wearing literally the style. She's wearing a cream. When she came to power, she was wearing yeah. those very yeah. sort of girlish. Yeah. And. Her wedding shoes are like this, they're exactly the same, the square toe, no heel, very flat, they, um, they own, they've got little ribbon ties, mm -hmm. they have, because I think she wore part of her bridal outfit, had the Honiton lace mm -hmm. on it, and to echo that, she's got little um, ribbon strips oh, nice across nice. the toe, but otherwise, it, she's just wearing exactly what women you know, Everyone we're does. wearing, yes, exactly. Wow. There's no real, and they just have their label um, in because they were made by Gundry and son of um, in London, uh -huh. who were the royal shoemakers. Right. But you know, if you didn't know that they were all by Queen Victoria, they would just be like everybody else's shoes. There's nothing overly, yeah, you, know, you don't think, wow. And then she almost ends that century where With women those. wearing those. Amazing. She was just there for so long. She's just seen quite a lot of styles and changes and boots, and, and she made like wearing boots very popular. Yeah, I would imagine because she's so quite the, an active lady. Wasn't yeah, she? the Balmoral boot and um, the elastic-sided boots. She was presented oh. with a pair, and so which was quite a good idea of the guy who painted them, and he presented her a pair, and she obviously quite liked them. And she then did. everybody was like, ooh, let's get on it. <laughs> the Queen's wearing yes. them, I think we can as well. So, well you were saying that about Northampton, um, Northampton mm. Museum, weren't you? The fact that Cromwell and then who was the other king? That king John. King John yeah. made Northampton the place yes. to come exactly. and get your shoes yes. made or to buy from this place. No, definitely. And it just, I mean, he came in 1213, King John bought a pair and I think his brother, whose name escapes me, I'm not sure what King John's brother's called, <laughs> he then slightly after that date, I think he came either came through the town or he came back to Northampton and bought um, a number of pairs of shoes which he then gave out to the poor. Wow. Now I don't know whether he gave them to the poor in Northampton or whether he took them back to London, you know, and gave mm -hmm. them out to the poor. Mm -hmm. So it was like yeah, so that's, that's sort of seal of, of, of approval or royal approval. That's great, um, yeah. And that and still works today. Well, and a lot of the, I mean, a lot of the factories that 
I mean, quite a number obviously aren't here anymore, but they used to have make footwear for the royal family as well. Mm. So there's um, Hawkins, who are no longer with us, they used to make uh, riding boots for Queen Princess Anne. Mm. Um, and various of the, we have examples of where they've made men's shoes for the various Edwards and, <laughs> <laughs> and things, you know. So, yes, and I think even. Sure, there's a royal connection. There's a bond connection, <laughs> but it's you know, it still it's seems it, to be how, yeah. It's still still the way that we we do it in this country, and then we sort of from that influence then sort of Kate at the moment yes. is like making people come to us for fashion. Exactly, which is very. very I mean, cool. I think, I, yeah, I think in a lot of places um, in the world. That Northampton is still seen as the place where you would get a very well-made, very traditional, very English pair of mm. men's shoes. And I know that the the five firms still in the town, which are um, Churchers, Crockett and Jones, Trickers, um, Edward Green, and Lob, um, you know, they're very successful. I think they're all doing extremely well at the moment. Um, and they open, you know, they're exporting and they're opening up shops, right. you know, around the world. Japanese and Italians really love, you know, that, the style. Mm -hmm. And I think also what's boosted is that we went through a period where it was about quantity. Mm. So it was like you could go into, you know, your cheap shop and buy mm. six pairs of shoes mm. and, you know, 12 t shirts for four ninety nine. Mm -hmm. you know, and then they wore out, you wore them twice, you could throw them away, but I think we're sort of going back to mm. that idea that, you know, maybe to have one or two really good pairs of mm. shoes or one nice suit, yeah, as opposed to lots and lots and lots of not so well made. Yeah, exactly. And I think they've benefited from that recently, definitely, that, you know, to have a really nice pair of shoes. I mean, it does make... When I was interviewing um, uh, ladies on the street uh, for my market research for this mm. project, that came up all the time. Yeah, like, yes. I want a shoe that lasts. So, yeah, it is still yeah. important yeah. to us. Our feet have to be yes. dry, exactly, and ready to go and do what we need to do. I know. I mean, I frequently get phoned up by particularly women who want to say what they want is a comfortable pair of shoes but look stylish at the same time and then it's a bit difficult because it's all in people's perceptions of what you think is stylish. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, but that is comfortable but yet stylish because obviously there are lots of very stylish shoes out there that aren't comfortable. No, exactly. But then throughout history it's sort of if you want to look good in a pair of shoes you're going to have to suffer somewhat. But I think a lot of people now, yeah, want that comfort as well. But yeah. it is difficult for women's more than men's. Because um, it's like, you know, people always then go, why do women have so many shoes? And it's like, you know, whereas a lot of men maybe have only you know, two or three. Yeah. It's, historically, it's the same. That we have very few early men's shoes because it's put down to the fact that even wealthy men or people could, who could afford, you know, more than one pair. Yeah. Um, usually didn't have more than one pair um, oh, it's right. only when they were like they'd worn and worn and worn their pair and they were forced to buy <laughs> forced to buy ah that sounds yeah, like, my, like that sounds yeah. like my, my brother-in-law <laughs> you know because I know lots of people who you know real men who loathe shoe shopping and yes. have that pair and so many of course people wear trainers these days yeah. so it's the trainer and then you might have a small pair yeah but I think also with women is that you, because you wear so many different outfits of different exactly. colours, you have to have more shoes to match everything. Whereas yeah. a man, I mean, particularly if you're just going to the office, if you're in a suit or a small pair of trousers, you, know, you can get away with wearing the yeah. same shoes exactly. 365 yeah. days a year. Yeah, exactly. Nobody notice. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why I think women end up with more shoes. Well, partly. Yeah, partly, yeah. yeah. And because... We're kind of um, more, um, 
we kind of go from one part of our lives to another part of our lives and we've got more kind of things going on at the same time so yeah. yes so we just that need as well. exactly I was, I, was, I was very interested to hear about um, the servant shoes that you were uh, that you had in your archive and you were telling me that um, they're not necessarily well, what we actually thought was that the pumps came from this servant shoe that um, the reason why Debbie pumps was so good was because they they would just slip their shoe the f foot into it and it was without laces and without too much bother and they could then go off and help their uh, lord or lady mm -hmm. and that's what we thought but actually you're saying maybe that it was everyone was wearing a flatter shoe and we don't know very much about what the servants were wearing because mm -hmm. they haven't lasted because no and it's sort of all the examples that you know we've, we've been looking at they are certainly the very early ones upper class examples and then as you get into the 19th century, you know, the, the middle class, upper class. Mm -hmm. And the way we know, because they've just survived, they're the ones that have survived, when mm -hmm. they've been passed out. So the way we get to know just as what ordinary people would have worn mm -hmm. is through concealed shoes, which are shoes that have been deliberately hidden in buildings for sort of good luck purposes. And they tend to be, um, not in all cases, but in the majority of cases, just ordinary people's footwear. Yeah. It's, it raises problems because people then assume that they found a shoe in a building and say it's like, I don't know, 1790, you mm. date the shoe roughly, that it must have belonged to the people who lived in the house. Mm. But it, that link has never been really made mm. for like various reasons because right. there's no like photographic evidence and it's very difficult. So a lot of people as well believe that people who put the shoes in the building could have been builders so okay. because they tend to be later in date than the house so the house say was built in 1650 oh, right. the shoe could be like 1810 oh, I see. Right. and so what it's thought and why one of the questions we ask is has the building been altered at any point because they one of the ideas is they think that by opening up the building, if you're having an addition to it or you're having alterations or building work, mm -hmm. that house is sort of exposed and oh. you need to do something that will sort of prevent anything coming into the house that might, you know, harm the house or its occupants. So it's quite possible that they might have belonged to, you know, the builder's wife yeah. or the builder's child or the builder or the workmen mm. and so it's difficult but they will be in most examples they're just ordinary people's footwear I mean that they're really well worn as you can see yeah. um, and what they sort of I suppose say is that they're of a very similar style to the you know the, the sort of more expensive the more um, upper class examples yeah. they just tend to be in heavier duty leather, they're more mm. practical. So you do, at the same time you get the slip-ons, you get, you know, the slip-on style. Mm -hmm. And sometimes as well, a lot of them have been um, modified. So they might have started out as something else. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you get boots and they've been cut down to make it more practical, just to, it's yeah, slip them on. on. Yeah. yeah. So, and also, Shoes have always hand been handed down mm -hmm. um, through families or from, you know, the master and mistress of the house to the servants when they, mm -hmm. you know, they would hand them down. They're very portable, you know, hand-me-down items. Mm -hmm. And also, so do you have to remember as, as well that depending on how far you were from London <laughs> is how on top of the fashion world you were. Oh, so I the see. further you got away from London or a really major town, you'd probably maybe wearing a style that went out of fashion, you know, ten years before or twenty years, but they're still you know, they're still wearable, you, you know, you can't afford maybe another pair, they're yeah. perfectly fine. Yeah. And so there is that sort of sometimes delay in what people would wear depending on mm. who they were. But I mean these are very you know, the little slip on 
shoes with a nice Still little got, toe cap. Yeah. And then they've just, I mean, these have got a little bit of a heel. And they've been mended and patched. But yeah, I mean, very. And the two I mean, as well, they would have been, they had more flexibility. Mm. It's just that while they've been hidden, they've obviously been exposed to fluctuations in temperature and they've gone all stiff. So mm. they would have been a lot softer. I mean, wearing them would have made them much more flexible. Mm. Sort of softer. But they are quite thick leather. Yeah. So they're just more practical than your little, <laughs> little slip-ons. Satin. Satin, exactly. <laughs> So they're just like cruder versions, really, in a way. Yeah. And these are a bit early because they've still got this little pointed tie. Yeah. Right, yeah. You know. But so the the reason why you don't see an awful lot of them is because they would just be run into the ground. Yes. And the only reason we have these is because they were hidden. Whereas, you know, what happened to its pair, yeah. I don't know. But yes, generally speaking, they would have been just worn until you couldn't wear them anymore, you patch, you can't patch them anymore and then you can't use the leather for anything and then that would have yeah. been it. Okay. And you do sometimes find, particularly like on Victorian um, like tips, you know, where you excavate like for glass bottles and all those sort of oh, things yes, that Victorians yes. were, you do get sometimes, you know, piles of shoes. really <laughs> well worn at the end of their life shoes. So they obviously did throw them away. Yeah when they did get to that point where that was it. Yeah. But yeah, she would just keep on wearing shoes as long as possible. Because they were quite expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, but mm -hmm. yeah. And then you see, in terms of like getting more active, I mean these again, you know, oh, yes. you could easily wear those today. Absolutely. I mean they're almost flat. They just I have like, this funny like a jazz little shoe. Almost. Yes. Like with a, a yes. With a rubber sole. But really, you know, much more practical. Well, to a point. Yeah, to a point. <laughs> <laughs> a little lace shoe. But yeah, really quite modern looking. And then they often did as well, shoemakers as um, sometimes as decoration, sometimes to hide the whole or well, the pin mm. mop for the last, they, they do these little, and um, yeah, and stamps, oh, and wow. you get them. That's amazing. But they're all, um, all the ones we've seen, apart from, I think probably, apart from this one, they're all hand sewn, so they're all, you know, mm. there's no machinery involved in it, so they're all handmade by somebody whether bespoke for somebody in particular mm -hmm. um, and these are more like you'd buy a bit more off the shelf because you know they're quite simple to make and actually for those that sort of style and the very sort of flat mm -hmm. then um, a lot of women made their own oh wow so they they like the women's journals of, of, of the day would carry patterns so you could mm -hmm. make your own if you mm -hmm. wanted to Wow, that's amazing. Because so I did have somebody doing some research. She was looking, I think she was doing a big dissertation about um, homemade as opposed to handmade by a shoemaker. Mm. And she came here to look through all the relevant dated shoes. But it's really interesting. And you can find the adverts and you can, you know, wow. and you can find, I think that there are two women's toolboxes. We have one in the Museum of Leathercraft and there's one, I think, in Aylesbury. Um, but it's so difficult because they are all handmade. Yes. So to make that distinction between handmade and then handmade but at home, mm. it's really difficult. Yeah. You'd have to be quite skilled though, wouldn't you? And quite. And then why wouldn't you then set yourself up in business because people well, like the way that you make shoes? So I think she came across one pair that were more cruder than the rest, which she thought maybe, but. You don't know. You don't know. It's like <laughs> it's a bit tricky. <laughs> interesting. Very interesting. But difficult to pinpoint down, really. You were saying also. I thought what was quite interesting is this heel. Heels are a sign of um, revolutionary times, or it seems to be. Um, there's a suggestion that yes, yeah, so. The higher the heel, the, the time of like unrest and 
you know, wars going on and then all the financial uh, unrest and sort of, um, I suppose, like depression. And whereas flat souls tend to be around more in the time of like peace and nothing particularly major going on in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of those, because that's what a lot of people suggest now, is that you see these really high, huge, mm. heeled platforms yeah. and we're all you know, going so through financial really. yes, unrest and uncertainty. And it's a way of sort of, I suppose it's like a way of almost saying, actually, you know, I might be going through difficult times, but I'm not going to show yeah. it through my shoes. Exactly. <laughs> I'm going to be... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm gonna put myself forward almost. And I suppose higher. it's very similar to it's like um, I think I'm sure I read an article ages ago, but like all the uh, all the unrest and all the war in like Kosovo and Croatia and everything yeah. at that time, and you're living under bombardment. There were still you know loads of women who would make the effort of getting all ready, dressed, and makeup, oh, wow. even in. And I suppose it's a way of asserting yourself in a time of really stress and, and unrest and also you know saying I suppose so I'm not going to be pushed mm -hmm. down by mm -hmm. you know what's going on around me Absolutely. you know when you think you know more important things to think about than your hair and makeup <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> but I suppose it's that outward sign and maybe the same with shoes that it's like right you know I'm going to wear these six inch heels just to make me feel better and to yeah, you know, present a yeah, a, 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 a you know positive sort of um, look. Now I don't know whether you know anything about Grecian style or anything like that, but mm. I had a theory that maybe this flat pump may have come from that kind of period. What do you think to that? It sort of could have been yeah influenced. I mean there was certainly. I think we have certain ones that look like they've been influenced by like that classical style mm -hmm. with a sort of you know twist in the sense I mean I think um, I mean there's certainly I mean even I mean this one I think you see this one would have been called a sandal even mm -hmm. though it's a it, yeah <laughs> 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 you see for when I'm cataloguing these shoes it's like we, it's like we call, it's like a slip-on shoe because oh, okay. it's sort of we wouldn't I don't think we would never use pump. You see, and it's funny because to me when I used to grow up, a pump was a a little black canvas yeah. <laughs> shoe. Yeah, that's a pump yeah. to me, <laughs> yeah. which is like a plimp sole. But um, so yeah, we've called it a slip-on shoe because it's not a court shoe either because no. court shoe. So, but this the cutouts as well have a sort of echo. Um, a little bit and I suppose it's just you know yeah I think some elements in that sort of looking back and classical style yeah came and translated itself into some of the footwear definitely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you Rebecca for your time no that's okay that's been brilliant <laughs> thank you so much um, and I'm going to have uh, shots of all these so we can get more detail of them. Okay. <laughs>